there's some psychological literature out there that basically points to the fact of how difficult it is to change a person's mind once they grab onto an idea. In other words, it gets back to this notion of why that number stays so resilient about people believing the, the, that the science community is largely not in agreement over this issue. And maybe that gets to, to the fundamental reason that it's much more difficult to change a person's mind after they've got an idea. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so a couple of things. One is that uh, I think what I've shown you is that the, the balance of news stories from years ago is probably still having an impact on how people think about this issue. Because if people could only like remember the last couple of days and the stories that were out there in the last couple of days, then this misperception of scientists would not be sustained. And you know, there's every reason to believe, let's face it, you know, the next, the 400th headline in the New York Times that says uh, temperatures going up, we got more ice melting, we got a, another polar bear who's unhappy, whatever those, those new pieces of evidence are, it's not really new news for people. And you can imagine how people would sort of look at that headline and then perhaps move on and not actually notice that the story is no longer a two-sided story. So there, that's one possible explanation. What it has to do with is the degree to which people take in information that might update their beliefs. But the fundamental thing psychologists have learned about attitude change is that there are sort of two groups of people, and I'm oversimplifying here on any issue. There are the people who have strong, solid opinions, and there are the people who do not have strong and solid opinions. And there's a certain degree of irony here. Imagine that you're running a political campaign, and you want to convince people to vote for your candidate. So you develop what you think are fabulous ads, and you put these ads on TV so that the people are to those ads who will then adapt their candidate preference accordingly. Here's the silly thing. The people who you can change are the people who don't have solid attitudes. The problem is they're not going to act on those attitudes. They're going to stay home and do something else on election day. Or whatever change you might produce, it will bounce right back to where it had been before. So the irony is the very people you can change are the people who are least likely to act on whatever belief you implant temporarily in their thinking. And what's been left out of campaigning is the fact that after you change people's opinions, you have to put a drop of glue on them. You have to hold them there somehow. That's the challenging part. Move them and glue them. And that's what campaigns don't do. My name's Martin Apple, and I'm a scientist. <laughs> My question is, you use the word balanced reporting. To me, when you put a one pound weight on one side and a one ounce weight on the other, and you tell me it's balanced, it isn't. What if you put quotes from 16 scientists who believe something because the data says so, and the one skeptic, and put that ratio in, have psychologists done those kinds of measures, and what kind of findings do you get? Yeah, great question. So um, I do not know of any studies that have done that sort of thing. But if in my um, reading of news media coverage of this issue, if you think about news stories, they kind of fall, again, into two categories. There are the ones like the one I showed you that has Steve Schneider, one guy, talking about what he thinks, and then a skeptic talking about what he thinks. That's like one against one. It sounds pretty balanced. Very, very rarely, if ever, I, mean, I don't remember an instance, that this news story begins by saying, now, 2,572 scientists agree with the first guy, and six people agree with the second guy. That, that if that were sort of acknowledged in the story, I could easily imagine that it would make a difference. But there's a certain irony to that. Think about you, the reporter, or you, the editor, putting that pair of facts in a story. Isn't somebody higher up going to say, why are you putting in the skeptic at all if there's only six people who agree with this? So there's, there's a sense in which if you want to put the skeptic in, you sort of can't acknowledge that the skeptic is rare. And therefore, perhaps that contributes in part to this lack of balance. Now, there are other stories, the second group of stories, focus on, yes, the IPCC report, zillions of scientists, very credible. Those stories also don't talk about the the number of skeptics. They just say thousands of scientists think this. They don't say thousands of other scientists don't think it, or six other scientists don't think it. Or, and so the question is, if you really looked at the flow of information, I think you'd have to say people weren't told that at all, or if they were, very rarely. And so, and I do think it would make a difference. <coughs> Excuse me, hi. <coughs> it was a very well done study and very useful. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Oh, I always hate those beginnings. <laughs> but, it's always a but, huh? Um, uh, having been in a position, or being in a position of having to respond to skeptics, those with opinions, but opinions that could be swayed, and those who simply rant strong opinions whose minds would not be changed short of having the oceans boil away in front of them. Um, I can see that uh, there are many holes in your procedure through which these folks are going to try to dig. We can discuss that later. I'll find it if you'd like. Um, the point I raised was just discussed, uh, so I won't expand upon that. Equal weighting uh, is not applied, so that questions the relevance or the significance and meaning of the survey. Uh, but let me put that in another way. You said one way, uh, one effective approach to, uh, to turn people in, this, in the right direction towards global warming would be to assume it's going to happen and discuss the consequences. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it make more sense or at least more appropriate to say, let's assume there's a 90% chance that it will happen, 10% chance that it will not, and then discuss what will be the consequences if we don't act versus if we act. If we don't act and it happens, obviously there's going to be a lot of consequences, economic and otherwise. Uh, if we do act, well, then we're in a good position if it does happen. And if it doesn't, well, it just comes down to a cost-benefit analysis. And perhaps if we do act and it doesn't happen, there are still benefits to be gained by reducing emissions, less pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, it makes sense to me, and I, I understand the strategy there. And uh, Steve Schneider, in particular, my colleague at Stanford, you probably know, has been very interested in exactly the issue you're talking about, which is how to describe to people the probability that climate change is what we claim it is, he says, as a scientist, that what the probability that it's human caused, the probability that it will have negative consequences, and the probability that particular consequences will occur. And the new IPCC report has one of my favorite footnotes of all times, um, talking about uh, what language to use to describe probability. So when we say very likely, we mean between an 80 and 90 percent probability. That's, that's all great. That's fine. But any discussion of that is not what I talked about here. Because what I talked about here was don't mention the percentage probability at all. Just say, you know, since we're going to hire her, since the planet's heating up, you know, and that, that's, a, that's a different approach, I think. And what these results would say is if you want to mention 90 percent, I, the skeptic, am going to say, how do you know it's 90 percent? Maybe it's 82 percent. And all of a sudden, we're now distracted on that issue instead of focusing on the consequences. But that's just what this one study shows. Okay. Actually, before I take the next question, I realized that uh, maybe it was you, somebody in the back. I, was, I failed to follow through on what I promised to say earlier. So I promised to talk about the idea that with auctioning cap and trade permits, what happens to the money, right? And so it turns out we did, there's another piece of this experiment that investigated that very issue. And we looked at what impact telling people about different dispositions the money would have. One we looked at was, what if we said the money will be put toward environmental protection programs? Didn't help at all. What if we said the money will be given to the poor? That hurt. People were less supportive of that. <laughs> but when we said the money will be refunded equally to all American taxpayers, and we described how much of a tax rebate everybody would get over a period of time, support went up considerably. So auctioning permits with a rebate of those funds to everybody, can you imagine government doing that, uh, made it very popular. 